Hi, I'm Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at Marco Presbyterian Church, where we bring hope to people with the truth of Jesus. And because that's our mission statement, we ask the question often, how do we bring hope? How do we spread hope as a people. And the reason that we want to ask that question is to stay on mission in all aspects of life. And so that's what we're doing in this sermon series, The Way of the King. How do we spread hope? Well, Jesus spoke of this often. And in one particular place, the Sermon on the Mount, he expressed our impact by calling us salt and light. Christians will be salt and light in a place where there is decay and darkness. How do we do that though? Well, he describes the character of a kingdom citizen in the Beatitudes. And so this series zeroes in on Matthew 5, 3 to 12, where he talks about the character of a citizen of the king. And what, what we wanna be able to do is follow the king. We're a people who make an impact by following in his ways. It's not an ideal sermon for an ideal life in an ideal world, but Sir, uh, Sinclair Ferguson in fact says, is that it's a, a description of kingdom life in a fallen world. Now you'd be blessed by these sermons where we learn more and more how to follow the way of the king. Good morning, everybody. Let's get those Bibles open, all right? Bibles, devices, whatever you've got, I would love to see them open to Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5. So here's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to read a sentence from God's Word, and then I'm going to try to explain that sentence to you, and then I'm going to tell you a story <clears throat> about that sentence, and then I'm going to apply it. You're going to go out and have a waffle, and then you're going to go home and obey it. <laughs> that sound like a good plan? Well, let's stand. Matthew 5. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read the seventh verse. What I'd like to do is read it to you, and then let's all read it together so you start to get your head and heart around it. Here we go. This is God's holy word, Matthew 5, verse 7. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's read it together. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy and inerrant word. You may be seated. Blessed, deeply happy, blessed, favored by God, at peace with God, empowered by God. Blessed are the merciful, for they as a consequence will receive mercy. Mercy, what is it? Mercy, what's it look like? How do you get it? Thank you, Gene. How do you get it? How do you show mercy? I think thanks to Gene this morning, it's the first time I've ever heard mercy used as a verb when one of the children tried to define mercy. It's being mercy. And I thought, you know, that's not totally wrong. It's a noun, but if she wants to turn it into a verb, that's what this generation does. So... So mercy, how do you show it? Do you need it? All the time. Do you want it? Are you a merciful person? Does it even matter? You see, we're drawn to this fifth beatitude. Remember, a beatitude is just a state of great joy. We're drawn to this beatitude for many reasons, maybe the biggest reason being that we all want mercy, right? We all need 
mercy. I mean, you want to be treated with mercy, right? Who wants to be treated cruelly? Who wants to be treated harshly, cold-heartedly, inhumanely, or, or to be more pointed, who wants to be treated as they deserve to be treated? You know, at first, I'll have to be honest, I read this sentence and I thought, you know, it's a really simple sentence. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Just go out of here and be nice to everybody. Short sermon, go home. But before you switch off, concluding that you've got this beatitude by the tail, let me stir the pot. You see, one of the highly qualified writers on these Beatitudes called them sacred paradoxes. You see, if you were to stand back and simply look at all eight of the Beatitudes, they're actually more challenging than they at first appear. In fact, a few of them seem to be contrary to one another. For example, last week, if you were here, we did Matthew 5, 6, about righteousness. Jesus is calling you and me to long for, yearn, desire righteousness from God as a gift from Jesus, his righteousness, as a standard of my behavior, but also as a definition of my work in the culture. And now I read, blessed are the merciful. I mean, hold on a minute. Righteousness and mercy seem to be mutually exclusive. How could you have both at the same time? I wish you'd followed me out after the first service to Waffles. I had so many questions about that, and I thought, great, people, it's, it's made people think I've stirred the pot. You see, you're either going to stand up for righteousness, what's right, what's true, what's just, or am I just supposed to go out there and turn a blind eye to what is righteous and just be nice to everybody? Illustration. One of your kids behaves really badly this afternoon. Are you going to discipline them? Or are you going to take them out for ice cream? You see, that gets to the contest. Now, to make headway here, we do need to define mercy. Mercy is pity in action. It's compassion in action. It's that choice that you and I are presented with to not harm someone who has harmed you, not to pay somebody back if they've done something wrong to you. Mercy is that sympathy that moves you to give of yourself to the needs of others, especially those who are not of your tribe who don't deserve to be treated well, quite possibly. Now, God's love is shown in this. I deserved his righteous wrath for my sin, but God showed his tender mercy to me by pouring out his righteous wrath on Jesus, not on me. Only God, you see, overcomes the paradox, the seeming paradox of these two Beatitudes. So what I want to do this morning, as I promised you, is I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you one of Jesus' parables. And I am doing this because not only do I have biblical warrant to do it because of the language, but I think it may help you. It has helped me as I've thought, how am I supposed to put this beatitude to work? So here's a, a parable of Jesus that illustrates what ten, tender mercy looks like. The story goes this way. And for you note takers, it's Luke 10. This guy's traveling. The story is told by Jesus this way. This guy's traveling from uh, Jerusalem down to Jericho, well-traveled road. And he's attacked by some robbers who beat him, steal from him, and leave him half dead in the ditch. Now, details are important. And Jesus was very deliberate. This man who has been robbed is Jewish. Now, because this was a well-traveled road, as I said, others are bound to come along, and sure enough, they do. 
And the first guy who comes along is part of the religious establishment of the day, a priest. And the priest, upon seeing this guy in the ditch, goes to the other side of the road and keeps on going. The second person who comes along the scene is also of the religious establishment, a Jew, a Levite, sees the guy lying in the ditch, goes to the other side of the road, and keeps on going. But Jesus, the master storyteller, then catches our attention at this point with the word but. So we've got these two guys with the religious establishment, keep on going, but a Samaritan. Again, details are critical. Jesus could have chosen all kinds of people, <laughs> but I tell you, he, talk about stirring the pot. He really stirred the pot big time with this one because Samaritans and Jews hated each other. I'm not going to take 29 minutes to explain the history. You can Google it yourself and read about it. There was so much animosity historically between these two people groups. And so Jesus really has reached down to stir the, stir the pot. A Samaritan comes. And the text reads, as he journeyed, he came to where our victim lay, and when he saw him, he had compassion. The Samaritan came to the Jewish man, knelt down, applied oil and wine, I take it some antiseptic qualities, on the man's wounds, bound them up, lifted the guy up on his own donkey, and walks beside him, takes him down to the nearest Hampton Inn, and, and, and took care of the man, you see. He, he went, he paid the bill, and stayed with him for the night. And the next morning, he comes down to the front desk, leaves enough money for the hotel bill for several days, as well as covering medical costs. And we know that historically from the amount that he gave to the person at the front desk. But then he explained, I'll be back, and I'll pay up any balance owing, and I'll take care of this man. The parable concludes with our word, mercy. The Samaritan showed this beat-up, robbed Jewish man mercy. Now, the question that should be grabbing you at this point is, who in the world is this good Samaritan? I want to meet a guy like this. Who is he? And we need to identify him. Now, Jesus, who is the creator of the parable, is himself the greater good Samaritan. Can you see him? He left heaven for you. Nothing bigger in all of history has ever occurred. He did the hardest thing that any human being could ever be called on to do. He left his Father in heaven. He came here. He made no excuses about how inconvenient it was going to be to come down or taking on the hardest job in the universe. We didn't hear anything about that. He didn't pass by on the other side of the road when he encountered you and when he encountered me, all torn up and messy from the sin and the dirt and the wounds of this world. He took pity on you, and he poured oil and wine on your wounds, and he bandaged you up, and he's coming back for you one day. He paid the price. In fact, Jesus entered our suffering more than even the Samaritan in our story. Suffering himself to show you a mercy that exceeds anything. And I love Gene. I got to hear Gene twice today, and I'm still trying to figure out how many drops were in that bottle. I, I was hoping somebody would Google it and shout out how many drops in an ounce of water. Anyway, if you get it, please holler. But the point was made, was it not, that his mercy is abundant, abundant. You see, no other religion in the world offers a merciful, good Samaritan Savior like this one. No other religion in the world offers a Savior who bears mortal wounds in his own body for you and can heal any wound that you have. So now we can put this thing down on the ground. Two things I want you to take home. First is this, the way of the king the way of the king is to receive. Again, just like last week, that's the biggest word in the sentence. 
The way of the king is to receive the king's mercy with open and empty hands. You can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. You will never be able to show true mercy to people on this island until you have become a heart-moved recipient of God's mercy yourself. The reason that the parable of the Good Samaritan is so life-changing is because of the context. In other words, Jesus didn't throw out a parable like an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It had a context, and the context helps us understand the potency of the parable. Because what we have in real life was a conversation Jesus had before he then told the parable. This lawyer, again details, Jewish lawyer, comes to Jesus and asks one of the world's biggest questions. Looks at Jesus and says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Okay, that's not a bad question. But some of you know what Jesus was like, whereas normally if someone asks you a question, you answer it if you can. Jesus often didn't. He asked the person a question himself. And so Jesus looks at this lawyer, Mr. Expert in the Law. How would you answer? What does the law say one must do to inherit eternal life. Well, the lawyer knew his Bible, and he said, well, you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. Well, Jesus gave him an A+. Plus. He got it. So Jesus said, do this and you will live. Knowing he couldn't do it, but he still wanted to play along with the lawyer to draw him out. Now the lawyer is smart enough to know uh, things are heating up here. I, I'm, not, I'm not coming out of this as good as I had hoped. So he says, uh, wait a minute. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, who's my neighbor? Asks Jesus, who's my neighbor? You see, he was a smart lawyer, right? We got lawyers in this room, so I'm trying to be careful. But he, but he who's my neighbor? You see, he wanted to limit who his neighbor was. And Jewish law was written that way, limiting it. In other words, who may I exclude was his real question. Jesus then crafted, on the basis of that question, this beautiful parable by asking now, at the end of the parable, a question that is the exact reverse of the, par of the question that the lawyer asked him. The lawyer said, who's my neighbor? So then Jesus turns the thing r upside down, and then he says, well, Mr. Law Expert, of the three guys who passed our guy in the ditch, which one? was the neighbor. You see, normally we read the parable as this poor victim, he's my neighbor, should I care for him or not? Jesus flips it and says, all right, Mr. Lawyer, of the three, which one was a neighbor? The priest? Jew to Jew? No. Levite, Jew to Jew? No. Now the lawyer his answer is this. The one who had mercy on him wouldn't even say Samaritan. That word was not going past his lips. The, but he had to answer honestly because he knew Jesus had him. The one who had mercy on him. Are you seeing how absolutely brilliant and potent this parable really is? Who's the neighbor? Jesus. Who's the good Samaritan? Jesus is. He's the one who showed mercy to his very enemies. And who needed mercy in the story? The lawyer. The lawyer was into self-justification. The lawyer would have fit into Marco Island beautifully. 
98% of the people on our island are into self-justification. That's why we're all messed up around the place. And the lawyer had it in spades. And so Jesus wants to say, you need mercy, and I'm the good Samaritan, and I will show you mercy, even though, understand, Jesus was the hated individual in the culture. You see, the lawyer wanted to hide behind the technicalities of the law. Oh, he knew the law, but not the music. That was his problem. He knew the law, but not the music. The law's good, but so is the music. And what's the music? The mercy of God to us in Jesus. The mercy of Jesus to, to us, who, like our victim, are lying half dead in the ditch of the brokenness of this messy world. We bear the scars of our own sins. We bear the scars of those who've sinned against us. I still can get emotional when I think of a young girl who came to my office in my previous church. She came in, she closed the door, she sat down, and through tears told me that her dad had sexually abused her. I sat there and asked the Lord for help. I offered her the gospel's healing mercy the best I knew how. Several weeks later, her dad walked into my office, closed the door, and confessed that he had sexually abused his precious daughter. I offered him the gospel's healing mercy. After justice was served, after justice was served, verse 6, his marriage, by God's grace, was restored. His relationship with his daughter was repaired. And to top it off, God provided a godly man who loved this girl. And as I performed that wedding, I had to fight back tears because God's mercy was so dominant in that life story. By God's mercy, that family's still together all because of the Good Samaritan Jesus. You see, when you experience God's mercy to you in Jesus, you're a changed person. You become a Good Samaritan yourself. You see yourself as that victim in the ditch, all messed up by sin, and the world's greatest neighbor, Jesus, walks by you. He doesn't cross to the other side of the road. He doesn't turn his head away. He comes beside you, and he kneels down and he dresses your wounds, and he patches you back together, and he picks you up, and he cares for every need you have out of the wealth of his endless resources, and one day he's going to return to take you home. That's mercy. Jesus is the neighbor. Jesus is the good Samaritan. Have you received his mercy? Have you received it? But the second thing I want you to take home today is this. The way of the king is not only to receive the king's mercy, the way of the king is then to show the king's mercy to everybody with full and generous hands. I mean, the question is obvious, isn't it? Any one of you actually could come up now and finish this sermon if you're a believer. You could. Will you be a neighbor like Jesus was to you, having received all the kindness and tenderness, the bend-over, backward mercy of Jesus? We're freed up from self-justification. We're freed up from pride. We're freed up from self-centeredness. We can give others. We can give to others what we ourselves have received so freely from God. All your needs are already met in Jesus. You can cross the road now. And you can bend over and care for others, especially those who are different from you. As has been said, grace runs downhill. That's just the way grace works. It runs downhill from God the Father to his son Jesus and now to you and to me. And so keep it running. Keep that grace running to everybody you encounter, especially to those who are quite different from you. You see, the Good Samaritan saves us from death, heals our wounds, pays for everything, 
promises to come back, when others pass us by, when we're hurting, when we're feeling defeated, when we're feeling as though things are too difficult, Jesus comes along and he binds up our wounds and picks us up and pays the price and gives us life and returns to take us home. The cross, you see, is where our good Samaritan did his greatest work. The cross is the only basis of our salvation. Self-justification is out the window, totally out of the window. But at the same time, the cross becomes now for you and me a powerful model for the way we ought to behave. Since the Good Samaritan has crossed the road, Jesus, and bent over to take care of it, you and me, let's go and do it too. Let's bend over and, and take care of people on Marco Island, Naples, Poland, Ethiopia, Ukraine, Iraq, Peru, Wherever God might send you this afternoon, maybe you'll be in for a surprise. Let's show Jesus' tender mercy to those who are like us. Let's show Jesus' tender mercy to those who are very unlike us, those we disagree with, those we take the very opposite views of things that we hold dear, those who might cancel us, and those who we'd like to cancel. Those who have lifestyles we don't agree with, all because our good Samaritan said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us to see you clearly, what your son is like, what your heart is like, to be even overwhelmed by a mercy that's so rich that we actually are motivated and empowered and enabled to get out of this room and to find somebody. If you don't send them to us, then send us to them that we may show good Samaritan mercy to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.